Good morning, and, and welcome to Good Shepherd United Methodist Church here, here in person and online. Announcements for this week. Remember our donation center for ACO and Dorcas Heart. The information about that is in our bulletin. Don't forget to check your calendar of events that are going on for this week, which is also included in the bulletin. Ladies, Ornament Exchange and Covered Dish Luncheon is Saturday, December 10th at 11 a.m. at Marcia Johnson's. Information on the sign-up sheet is on the welcome table. Carpooling is suggested. The December 2nd Sunday Social Dinner is next Sunday, December 11th at Anna Sophia's. Immediately following the service, please sign up at the welcome table. Sewing with a Purpose will meet this month on Wednesday, December 14th at 11 a.m. This group makes pillowcases and quilts for the Child Children's Advocacy Center. You do not need to be able to sew to participate. Now, I've seen the ladies working, and I've seen the products they put out. It is just fantastic. They do such a great job. Thank you, ladies. SPRC announced the Christmas love offering to the staff. Love offerings can be placed in the basket by check or in one of the other giving uh, or in one of our giving envelopes. Please make sure you mark the, the check or envelope as love offering. Our Christmas Eve service is at 5 p.m. Make sure to invite your family and friends. Thank you. different now um, we have a couple of things I need to tell you about the very first I need to tell you about is today is the 129th birthday of this church wow. oh. started on this day in 1893 83 I can't remember now. which one is it just slowly coming And I've been the pastor the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so that's a great thing. Yes. Next year we'll have something even more exciting because it'll be 1.30. Okay, the other thing I wanted to tell you about is that uh, I've only had one person ask me about this, and uh, so I decided I better say something. Our stewardship campaign will be in j January for that year. So that's when we're going to be doing that. And so I would like for you guys to really consider what you can give to the church at that time. We have this new building. Hopefully we'll get occupancy this week. Cross our fingers, pray for that. Uh, and we will be able to um, open it up and start some new ministry in that building. We are having tours of it today, which means no, you don't have to sign up and, and Jim's <laughs> not going to personally take you around. But it, it's buildings open so we you can go in and look at the new building and see what it looks like it's fantastic now the last thing I have is kind of I want your opinions so speak up but I have had uh, lots of conversations with lots of clergy friends about what to do about Christmas Day and I know that if you have company probably you'd rather come on Christmas Eve it's much more festive and and it has a significant kind of feeling to it, and uh, not come on Sunday morning, on Christmas Day. So I am uh, considering recording Christmas morning and putting it on Facebook so you can watch it when you want. And, uh, and you know, before you open presents, after you open presents. But, but it will be fairly short, uh, and it will be a time where we can pray and start out the, this Christmas season. You know, the Christmas season is uh, is between now and 
epiphany. So it's not over at Christmas Day. It's over January 6th. So it's not something that we, you know, I, even though I'll probably take down my tree on the 25th because I'm tired of it by then. You know, and I have found that the German Shepherd can wipe out every bulb off the tree within three feet of its height. So, you know, I keep laying them under the tree because I just don't want to put them back up again. Um, so, yes, I'm not saying you have to keep the tree up or you have to whatever. I mean, that's, you know, that's sort of like not wearing white shoes after uh, Labor Day. Uh, I, I find that to be a little pedantic. Mm -hmm. So, what do you guys think about that? Is that okay, or were you going to bring family? Are you, uh, are you wanting to come on Christmas Day? Because I can do that. It's just that I don't want to, uh, you know, make you feel like you have to be here or that that's something that we have to do uh, because I know that a lot of you have family or you go to family and all that business. So, speak. <laughs> okay. Huh? Live. Are you being facetious or? Okay. That's very true. That is very true. And people that don't have family. Okay. Okay. Good. That's good. That's what I needed to know. That's what I needed to know. Okay. So we'll have Christmas service. So we'll need your MP3. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yeah, why not? I thought about that. Okay. That sounds great. See, this is what I needed to know. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're going to have coffee and donuts. Don't fill up. No, we won't set up tables. We'll set up chairs. Informal. We're just going to not take the chair. We'll just move the chairs around so that they're more conversational. Huh? <gasps> if, we ha if we can, we could. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we'd have to be moving. But that's okay. We have chair. We have chairs in storage. If you keep bringing our own chairs, <laughs> <laughs> our mom's chairs in the building. Well, okay. <laughs> I don't know that that's that important. I think having it in the new sanctuary probably or the new building would be more fun. <laughs> Unless we drag the tree down. <laughs> All right. Okay, we have ideas. That sounds great. I like that. I like it a lot. Uh, I especially like the casual because I think that's what we need to do is celebrate that on that day. So, All right. Uh, that was all of the things I had to say. So now we're going to do the candle lighting. Cindy? We light this candle as a symbol of Christ who is our peace, the divine made fully present in human life. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation, that the keeping of Advent may open our hearts to God's peace, that the light of Christ may penetrate the darkness of sin, that this wreath may constantly remind us to prepare for the coming of Christ that the Christmas season may fill us with peace and joy as we strive to follow the example of Jesus. All together now. Loving God, your church joyfully awaits the coming of its Savior, who enlightens our hearts and dispels the darkness of ignorance and sin. Pour forth your blessings upon us 
As we light the candles of this wreath, may we reflect the splendor of Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Now let us stand as we sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Thank you, Cindy. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, and let this end to be. With God, our Creator, children all are we. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Please join me in our call to worship. Get ready, people of God. The time of hope and peace is at hand. We are called to action rather than reaction. Open your hearts to God's word and God's will. Help us to be workers for God rather than observers. Come, draw near to God in faith. Let us prepare our hearts to receive the wondrous gifts of God. Amen. Please be seated. And let us prepare for prayer. Almighty God, we come to you today full of anticipation and expectation about this season, full of what we think should be and what shouldn't be, full of the expectation of how we might be and how we really are. We pray that you will be with these people as we pray for them this day, for Karen and for Ron, for Robert and Carolyn, for Daryl W. and his dad, J.D., for Michael S. and Gary J. and Marcia. We pray for Gerald and the Kendall family, and we pray for Grayson and pray that he is strengthening and that he is going to be um, surprised by his diagnosis and we pray for Don. We pray for all these people and all the things that they are dealing with. We pray for ourselves and all the things we are dealing with. We pray for those that are in our hearts that we know to be with us. We know them, we know their problems, we know that their faith is being strengthened at the same time that they are doubting their faith. Doubt is not a bad thing, Lord. It helps us to strengthen what we believe. Give us that strength over doubt and help us to have this season as a beginning, a new beginning for this church, a new beginning for each of us that it is not over, we're not on the downhill side, but we are beginning once again to be what you want us to be. We are beginning to know what we are in this city, who we can be together, and how we can grow the kingdom of God. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend. Amen. Now let us stand and say, sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Christ the Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we need, have not heard the cry of the needy. <coughs> Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You promised that a shoot would come from the stump of Jesse and your spirit would rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. His presence was prepared for us by John the Baptist. By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. All might live in harmony with one another and together glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly blank bank banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will those that are serving please come forward?
because there is one loaf, we are, who are many are one body, for we partake, all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is the sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood in Christ. Come to the table. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself up for us. Open the world to the joy of your gift, Jesus Christ, that all might know and believe. 
Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. about a little girl named Casey who happened to be five years old, and she was about ready to go into kindergarten. It was right that time, and she was so excited. She couldn't hardly stand it. She had a little sister named Jamie who watched her in fascination as she talked about how great kindergarten was going to be and how wonderful it was going to be. And on the Sunday before kindergarten started, she skinned her knee. So she was crying and carrying on, and her little sister was trying to comfort her, and she said, Don't worry, Casey. If you die, you'll go to heaven. <laughs> and Casey started crying even harder, and, and, and she said, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to kindergarten. <laughs> and I think we're all kind of like that. We have expectations, and we want them to happen. Today, although it's the day of peace for Advent, I am going to talk about expectations and how they affect our vision of peace and hope in the world. Once again, we are preparing for the advent of the Christ child, but the meaning of the Christ child is all-encompassing in the life of Jesus Christ and, of course, in his death and resurrection. All these things give us hope, a hope for the reign of, the reign of God that has been promised. Leslie Newbigin is a prominent theologian, and his focus is on mission and the action of Christianity. And he tells this story about looking the wrong way, or what I would call expecting one thing and missing the other. He says, I once visited a village in the Madras Diocese. There was no road into the village. You reached it by crossing a river, and you could do it either by the south side of the village or the north side. The congregation assumed I would come by the southern route, and they had prepared a welcome that only an Indian village can prepare. There was music and fireworks and garlands and fruit and silumbum, which is a southern Indian martial art done on ceremonial occasions. Everything you can imagine was ready. Unfortunately, I entered the village at the north end and found only a few goats and chickens. This was a crisis. I had to disappear while word was sent to the assembled congregation and the entire village did a U-turn, and I suddenly appeared. This is what it means by metanoia, which is uh, the Greek word for repentance, turning the other way, changing your mind. The reign of God has drawn near, but you can't see it because you are looking the wrong way. You are expecting the wrong thing. What you think is God isn't God at all. You have to go through a mental revolution. Otherwise, the reign of God will be totally hidden from you. Now I'm going to read Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and his faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall, shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand in the, on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. On that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that is left of his people, from Assyria, from Egypt, from Panthros, from Ethiopia, from Elam and from Shinar, from Hamath and from the coastlines of the seas. This is the word of the Lord. Now I'm going to read from Matthew, verse... Chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, once again. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with the water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is the word of the Lord. I did that because I wanted you to know that they're both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's not anything else that's happening uh, that hasn't already been said. Isaiah is speaking of expectation and anticipation. And perhaps... If we all turned our expectation into anticipation, we would have less anxiety in our lives. Isaiah says, The shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, a stump, the tree cut down, cut off, unproductive, but a branch shall grow out of that stump. We've all dealt with plants like crepe myrtles, they're notorious, and other shrubs that come up, and some weeds that come up wherever, all the time, can't hardly ever get them done. Uh, We have a vine in our yard. It started in one side, now it's all through a bunch of others. But I pull it up, if the roots are long, it comes up again. I can't kill it, I haven't found anything that will kill it. The roots just keep on producing more vines, and they have thorns on them. It's not nice. That is what Isaiah is talking about. The stump looks dead, but it has mighty roots. In other words, the Israelites look like they're done. Their country is no longer theirs. Their temple is no more. But they aren't dead. They have deep roots nourished by God. And they shall rise again. And not only will they rise, but they will have the Spirit of the Lord rest on their leader. This leader will have wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I believe that the strength to rise again, to not let our faith grow faint, is what we can give the world. Even when things look hopeless and grim, all but dead, we can hope in the peace of God. We can bring light into a world that looks hopeless and beaten down. Jesus is our example of this. It works so well to read the Gospels and to know that God is ever-present and always involved in our lives. Advent gives us that space to imagine that reign of God. We are at the beginning of the story, but we all know the whole story, and it should fill us with peace and with hope. Isaiah goes on to say that the leader, this Messiah, will not 
be, will not judge by what his eyes see or his ears hear. So this is kind of a cautionary tale to us that what we have and what we say we are doesn't really mean anything to God. It's not what it is. It's not the accomplishments you have. It's not the things that you've acquired. Jesus is just not impressed. These things, these accomplishments, these things of the world, don't have a place in the reign of God. Because as you might remember from a few weeks ago, I said that the reign of God is not, not so much a place, but a relationship. These things, although they're nice for us, are not much to your relationship with God. Isaiah goes on to say that the Messiah, the leader, will go right to work dealing with righteousness. That means he's going to do what is right regardless, as he takes care of the poor and meek. Jesus is leveling the playing field. Something we talk about doing, but we never know exactly how to do it. You know, it's really hard to level the playing field and let the poor and meek have the same things that we have, that we already have. But Jesus is taking a stand. Our American work ethic tells us that everyone needs to work hard for what they get for what they want. And that works fine if everyone has an education, everyone gets to eat, everyone has health care. You know where I'm going. Then Isaiah says to the leader, the Messiah, will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Now this is a very interesting thing. You remember when I talked, told you about the, the rod, a shepherd's rod is not for beating something, it's for guiding. He's going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He's going to tell you and didn't tell you what you need to do. That word has much power. Now, what we do understand is then he says that his breath will kill the wicked. I think there's something that we need to really think about in this verse, and that is grace. Because it's there, we just don't recognize it. If, one Messiah, if the Messiah strikes the earth with his word, then all will repent and be saved. That's what it's for. And then the breath of the Messiah will kill the wicked, the few that deny God's existence, the few that will not decide that Christ is their Savior. So there is a chance for everyone to repent. So we have to remember that, that this is a twofold method of dealing with those with little faith or faithlessness. That it's not some mean thing that he's saying, it's an opportunity to be saved. Isaiah concludes with the Messiah wearing righteousness and, and uh, faithfulness, well, belts, two belts, different places. I'm not too sure what that means, but I think it would be a good thing if we all wore a little righteousness and faithfulness. That when we put on our pants in the morning, we're putting on our pants of righteousness and faithfulness so that we will remember that that's the way we're walking through the world. I think it would be a really good idea. You know, I, I can't remember the, who did this quote. Kathy can probably tell me or Sue or some of the people. In, because I'm doing a book study and I did a Bible study at the same time. I kept getting mixed up about what was in what book. So I don't know if this is Aunt, uh, Barbara Brown Taylor or if it was Jill, Amy Jill Levine, but they said, and I, it, just, it was just one of those short sentences that just struck me, expectation is the root of all heartache. Isn't that true? If we don't get what we expect, we're broken. What if we anticipated what was to come without expecting? How much better would that be? I think that's something we can kind of, you know, especially in this season, we can understand. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have uh, little catalogs at my, at my house that have circles around them where all the grandkids have circled what they want for Christmas. I'm sure you all have seen those with your grandkids. You know, you get them out and go, well, what do you like? Well, it's like everything on this page, everything on this page, every, next page, everything on this page. Not the girl stuff, everything on this page. <laughs> But um, 
but they, you know, their expectation is that they might get those things until Christmas morning, and they all of a sudden forget, and whatever you open is cool. So, you know, they kind of replace their expectation with anticipation. It is so exciting to get it that whatever it is is okay. So I think that's kind of the way we ought to look at things. Instead of expecting something, a certain outcome that we supposedly have control over, we anticipate the goodness that is going to come. That's kind of the kingdom of God right there. That knowing that good is going to come. Isaiah's next verses are ones that you've heard many times. The wolf and the lamb, the bear and the cow, or whatever it was. Anyway, you, you all remember the, the picture of the peaceable kingdom. And I'm talking about the one that Edward Hicks. Edward Hicks was a Quaker minister and a farmer. And he has, he during the 1800s, he painted this picture over a hundred times of the peaceable kingdom. Yes, his animals have really kind of creepy eyes. So that's how you remember it, because I got this. Anyway, but what happened was in the very beginning when he painted them, there's little angels down here, and there's actually, um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, but there's uh, you know military people in the background that are signing a tr peace treaty. And there's children playing around in the animals, and the animals are all kind of relaxed, and there's baby animals playing in the front. And then you get to the later in his, his, his life, and they look a little different. Let me read what the historian says. What historians noted was a subtle change in the depiction of the animals in the paintings. In the old, older ones, or in the new, older gear-wise, so the first ones, they were kind and even playful as they lie together, predator and prey. But as time went on, the teeth grew sharper and the snarls more pronounced. And that's true. The leopard is snarling in those later pictures. Hicks was said to have begun to lose hope in humanity as he watched barriers grow higher and stronger and animosity grow deeper and more violent. In those latter paintings, however, the child, the Christ, the little fat kid in the middle, tightens his grips on the lion's mane and puts his arm around the bear's neck and holds them in place with strength when their will was not with him. Hicks, though he began to lose hope in the workings of hum the human community, began to cling even more tightly to Christ. In Christ, Hicks was to put his hope. That is very true. If we think we or somebody we know is going to fix this, it's probably not going to work. How many centuries have we gone thinking that way and doing things the same way? If somebody does something wrong with you, let's have a war. How many times have we done that? A billion? Anyway, Derek Weber says this. This is what I'll close with. That what... Advent reminds us not that a festive season and a small celebration is returning once more because the calendar pages have turned, but that hope out of despair is possible. Life out of death is real. A dream of the way of living that honors God and neighbor both is not only possible but is within reach. If we set aside that which keeps us apart, those differences that make us suspicious of one another and hold on to the common humanity that makes us so similar, we will make it. When we share Emmanuel, God among us, we stand as a signal to the nations that there is a God among us, that there is a way we can know peace, there is hope in the midst of despair, and there is joy in brokenness. We are called to stand as a signal. stand and say it came upon a midnight clear.
with the herring circling years till come the time foretold and peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendor swing and the whole world turn back a song which now the Almighty God, we thank you for the blessings of our life, and we give back to you in thanks for those blessings. May they be used to create the kingdom of God that you can bring to the earth. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. song we just sang, it says in the last verse, I believe, it, that the angels are going to fling peace on us. And I think that's such a great idea, flinging peace. Let's fling some peace this week, all right? Amen. 